if you're experiencing the fear and loathing that I am about how come how close we have come as a species to ecological oblivion how close our country has come to democratic oblivion <clears throat> perhaps we can pass the time together by revisiting a timely book from uh, nearly 50 years ago 1972 the year I was born my fellow Kentuckian Hunter S. Thompson fear and loathing on the campaign trail chapter February fear and loathing in New Hampshire back on the campaign trail in Manchester Keene and the Booth Fish Hatcheries. Harold Hughes is your friend. By the way, these are uh, like uh, little simple headlines. Fear and Loathing in New Hampshire. Back on the campaign trail in Manchester Keene in the Booth Fitchery Fish Hatcheries. Harold Hughes is your friend. Weird Memories of 68, a private conversation with Richard Nixon. Will Dope Doom the Cowboys? A first, massive and reluctantly final judgment on the reality of George McGovern. Small hope for the hammer and no hope at all for the press wizards. Chapter begin. After I uh, take one more uh, hit for good measure from the sacred herb. Like the good doctor once said, Hunter S. Thompson, doctor, journalist. I don't recommend drugs, violence, or insanity to anyone, but they've always worked for me. All right. It was just before midnight when I left Cambridge and headed north on US 93 towards Manchester. Driving one of those big green rented auto stick cougars that gets rubber for about 29 seconds a drive and spits hot black divots all over the road in first or second. A terrible screeching and fishtailing through the outskirts of Boston, heading north to New Hampshire, back on the campaign trail, running late as usual, left hand on the wheel and the other on the radio dial, seeking music, and a glass of iced wild turkey spilling into my crotch on every turn. Not much of a moon tonight, but a sky full of very bright stars, freezing cold outside, patches of ice on the road and snow on the side hills running about 75 or 80 through a landscape of stark naked trees and stone fences. The highway is empty and no lights in the roadside farmhouses. People go to bed early in New England. I'm not going to read that without making the notation that drinking and driving is completely stupid and against the law. One of the laws that makes sense. So don't do it. If you're going to drink in a van, make sure it's a broken down van that doesn't move, such as this one, the van came. Four years ago, I ran this road in a different Mercury, but I wasn't driving then. It was a big yellow sedan with a civvy clothes cop at the wheel. Sitting next to the cop up front were two of Nixon's top speechwriters, Ray Price and Pat Buchanan. There were only two of us in, in back, just me and Richard Nixon. We were talking football in a very serious way. It was late, almost midnight then, too, and the cop was holding the big Merc at exactly 65 as we hissed along the highway for more than an hour between some American Legion Hall and a small town somewhere near, near Nashua, where Nixon had just made a speech to the airport up in Manchester, where a Learjet was waiting to whisk the candidate and his brain trust off to Key Biscayne for a think session. It was a very weird trip, probably one of the weirdest things I've ever done, and especially weird because both Nixon and I enjoyed it. We had a good talk, and when we got to the airport, I stood around the Learjet with Dick and the others, chatting in a very relaxed way about how successful his swing through New Hampshire had been, and as he climbed into the plane, it seemed only natural to thank him for the ride and shake hands. But suddenly I was seized from behind and jerked away from the plane. Good God, I thought as I rolled backwards. Here we go. Watch out, somebody was shouting. Get the cigarette. A hand lashed out of the darkness to snatch the cigarette out of my hand. Then other hands kept me from falling, and I recognized the voice of Nick Rue, Nixon's chief advance man for New Hampshire, saying, God damn it, Hunter, you almost blew up the plane! I shrugged. He was right. I'd been leaning over the fuel tank with a burning butt in my mouth. 
Nixon smiled and reached out to shake hands again, while Rue muttered darkly and the others stared down at the asphalt. The plane took off and I rode back to the Holiday Inn with Nick Rue. We laughed about the cigarette scare, but he was still brooding. What worries me, he said, is that nobody else noticed it. Christ, those guys get paid to protect the bus. Very bad show, I said. Especially when you remember that I did about three king-size Marlboros while we were standing there. Hell, I was flicking the butts away. Lighting new ones. You people are lucky I'm a sane, responsible journalist. Otherwise, I might have hurled my flaming zip onto the fuel tank. Not you, he said. Egomaniacs don't do that kind of thing. He smiled. You wouldn't do anything you couldn't live to write about, would you? Oh, you're probably right, I said. Kamikaze is not my style. I must prefer subtleties, the low-key approach, because I am, after all, a professional. We know. That's why you're along. <sighs> Don't set the plane on fire. Or if you are close to uh, he who shall not be named, and we were going to commit suicide anyway. That's as good a place as any, is all I'm saying. That was not professional advice. <sighs> Actually, the reason was very different. I was the only one in the press corps that evening who claimed to be as seriously addicted to pro football as Nixon himself. I was also the only out front openly hostile peace free. The only one wearing old Levi's and a ski jacket. The only one, no, there was one other, who'd smoked grass on Nixon's big Greyhound press bus, and certainly the only one who habitually referred to the candidate as the Dingbat. So I still had no, cr so I still had to credit the bastard for having the balls to choose me. Out of the 15 or 20 straight heavy press types who had been pleading for two or three weeks for even a five-minute interview, as the one who should share the back seat with him on his final ride through New Hampshire. For there was, of course, a catch. I had to agree to talk about nothing except football. We want the boss to relax, Ray Price told me, but he can't relax if you start yelling about Vietnam, race riots, or drugs. He wants to ride with somebody who can talk football. He cast a baleful eye at the dozen or so reporters waiting to board the press bus and then shook his head sadly. I checked around, he said, but the others are hopeless, so I guess you're it. Wonderful, I said. Let's do it. We had a fine time, I enjoyed it, which put me, a, put me a bit off balance because I'd figured Nixon didn't know any more about football than he did about ending the war in Vietnam. He had made a lot of allusions to things like in runs and power sweeps on the stump, but it never occurred to me that he actually knew anything more about football than he knew about the Grateful Dead, but I was wrong. Whatever else might be said about Nixon, and there is still serious doubt in my mind that he could pass for a human, he is a goddamn stone fanatic on every facet of pro football. At one point in our conversation when I was feeling a bit pressed for leverage, I mentioned a down-and-out pass in the waning moments of the 1967 Super Bowl mismatch between Green Bay and Oakland to an obscure second-string Oakland receiver named Bill Miller that had stuck in my mind because of its pinpoint style and precision. He hesitated for a moment, lost in thought. Then he whacked me on the thigh and laughed. That's right, by God, the Miami boy. I was stunned. He not only remembered the play, but he knew where Miller had played in college. That was four years ago. LBJ was our president, and there was no real hint in the winter of 68 that he was about to cash his check. Johnson seemed every bit as tough and invulnerable then as Nixon seems today. And it is slightly unnerving to recall that Richard Nixon at that point in his campaign appeared to have 
about as much chance of getting himself elected to the White House as Hubert Humphrey appears to have now in February of 1972. When Nixon went to New Hampshire, he was viewed by the pros as just another of these stubborn right-wing waterheads with nothing better to do. The polls showed him comfortably ahead of George Rom Romney, but according to most of the big-time press wizards who were hanging around Manchester at the time, the Nixon-Romney race was only a drill that would end just as soon as Nelson Rockefeller came in to mop up both of them. The bar at the Wayfair Motor Inn was a sort of unofficial press headquarters where the press people hovered in nervous anticipation of the Rockefeller announcement that was said to be coming at any moment. So as not entirely outcome, overcome at the invitation to spend an hour alone with Richard Milhouse Nixon. He was, after all, a born loser. Even if he somehow managed to get the Republican nomination, I figured he didn't have a sick goat's chance of beating Lyndon Johnson. I was as guilty as all the others that year of treating the McCarthy campaign as a foredoomed exercise of noble futility. We had talked about it a lot, not only in the Wayfair Bar, but also in the Bar of the Holiday Inn, where Nixon was staying. And the press consensus was that the only Republican with a chance to beat Johnson was Nelson Rockefeller. And the only other possible winner was Bobby Kennedy, who had already made it clear, both publicly and privately, that he would definitely not run for president in 1968. I was remembering all of this as I cranked the big green cougar along the U.S. 93 once again four years later to cover another one of those flaky New Hampshire primaries. The electorate in this state is notoriously perverse and unpredictable. In 1964, for instance, it was a thumping victory of the New Hampshire primary that got the Henry Cabot Lodge steamroller off to a roaring start. And in 68, Gene McCarthy woke up on the morning of Election Day to read in the newspapers that the last-minute polls were nearly unanimous in giving him between 6 and 8 percent of the vote. And even McCarthy was stunned, I think, to wake up 24 hours later and find himself with 42 percent. Strange country up there, New Hampshire and Vermont, appeared to be the East's psychic answer to Colorado and New Mexico. Big lonely hills laced with back roads and old houses where people live almost aggressively by themselves. The insularity of the old-timers, nursing their privacy along with their harsh right-wing politics, is oddly similar and even receptive to the insularity of the newcomers, the young dropouts, and former left-wing activists, people like Andy Kopkind and Ray Mungo, co-founder of the Liberation News Service, who's been moving into these hills in ever-increasing numbers since the end of the 60s. The hitchhikers you find along these narrow, twisting highways look exactly like the people you see, on the roads around Boulder and Aspen, Taos. The girl riding with me tonight is looking for an old boyfriend who moved out of Boston and is now living, she says, in a chicken coop in a sort of informal commune near Greenville, New Hampshire. It is five or six degrees above zero outside, and she doesn't even have a blanket, much less a sleeping bag. But this doesn't worry her. I guess it sounds crazy, she explains, but we don't even sleep together. He's just a friend. But I'm happy when I'm with him, because he makes me like myself. Jesus, he thought. We've raised a generation of stone desperate cripples. She is 22, a journalism grad from Boston University, and now, six months out of college, she talks so lonely and confused that she is eagerly looking forward to spending a few nights in a frozen chicken coop with some poor bastard who doesn't even know she's coming. The importance of liking yourself is a notion that fell heavily out of favor during the Coptic anti-ego frenzy of the acid era. But nobody guessed back then that the experiment might churn up this kind of hangover? A whole subculture of frightened illiterates with no faith in anything. The girl's not interested in whatever reasons I might have for going up to Manchester to spend a few days with the McGovern campaign. She had no plans to vote in any election for president or anything else. She tried to be polite. But it was obvious after two or three minutes of noise that she didn't know what the fuck I was talking about and cared less. It was boring. Just another queer hustle in a world full of bummers that will swarm you every time if you don't keep moving. Like her, boy, like her ex-boyfriend. At first he was only stoned all the time, but now he was shooting smack and acting very crazy. He would call and say he was on his way over, then not show up for three days, and then he'd be out of his head, screaming at her, not making any sense. It was too much, she said. She loved him, but he seemed to be drifting away. We stopped at a donut shop in Marlboro, and I saw she was crying, which made me feel like a monster because I'd been saying some fairly hard things about junkies and loonies and doom freaks. Waiting on the morning after.
This is how I deal with my anxiety. I don't know about you people. Once they let you get away with running around t for 10 years like a king hoodlum, you tend to forget now and then that about half the people you meet live from one day to the next in a state of such fear and uncertainty that about half the time they honestly doubt their own sanity. These are not the kind of people who really need to get hung up in depressing political trips. They're not ready for it. Their boats are rocking so badly that all they want to do is get level long enough to think straight and avoid the next nightmare. This girl I was delivering up to the chicken coop was one of those people. She was terrified of almost everything, including me, and this made me very uncomfortable. We couldn't find the commune. The directions were too vague. Go far to the dim yellow light, then right at the, ne right at the big tree. Proceed to the fork and then slow to the place where the road shines. After two hours of this, I was half crazy. We've been back and forth across the same grid of back roads two or three times with no luck, but finally we found it. A very peaceful looking place on a cold hill in the woods. She went inside the main building for a while, then came back out to tell me that everything was okay. I shrugged, feeling a little sad because I could tell by the general vibration that things were not really okay. I was tempted to take her into Manchester with me, but I knew that would only compound the problem for both of us. Checking in the Wayfair at 3.30 then up, Again at 7 for a quick breakfast and then into the press box, press bus for a long day of watching McGovern shake hands with people at factory gates. Could she handle that madness? Probably not. And even if she could, why do it? A political campaign is a very narrow ritual where anything weird is unwelcome. I trouble enough by myself. They would never tolerate me if I showed up with a nervous blonde nymphette who thought politics was some kind of game played by old people. Like bridge? I think I forgot to take my morning dose of meds. I'll be right back. Therefore, the PTSD, which I got from many sources, mainly just from watching innocent, unarmed black men get shot every week, one after another after another, by the people that are supposed to be protecting us. In fact, that's why I pulled onto the wrong side of the road and interrupted the arrest of a young unarmed black man in Joshua Tree and caught myself a case at the San Bernardino County Courthouse. November 23rd, 23 being an auspicious day uh, for the Robert Anton Wilson fans out there, I am to show up for my hearing. For responding to my PS PTSD by immediately jumping into action to try to protect this man who was about to get beat down by four officers who were rolling up on him like he was John fucking Dillinger. But that's another story. We've got to stabilize. Be right back. Well, Butrin, check. Lexa Bro, check. Blue Dream Cannabis, check. Coffee, cream and brown sugar, check. Miss Gruffles, emotional support animal. Emotional support animal, where are you? Miss Gruffles! Miss Gruffles has forsaken me. Well, I guess I'll just have to lean hard on the coffee, cannabis, Will Butrin, and Lexapro. And literature of revolution. <sighs> could she handle that madness? Probably not. And even if she could, why do it? A political campaign is a very narrow ritual where anything weird is unwelcome. 
I am trouble enough by myself. They would never tolerate me if I showed up with a nervous blonde nymphette who thought politics was some kind of game played by old people like Bridge. No, it would never do. But on my way into Manchester, driving like a werewolf, it never occurred to me that maybe I was not quite as sane as I'd always thought I was. There is something seriously bent when you think on it in the notion that a man with good sense would race out of his peaceful mountain home in Colorado and fly off in a frenzy like some kind of electrified turkey buzzard to spend three or four days being carried around the foulest sections of New England like a piece of meat to watch another man who says he wants to be president embarrassing a lot of people by making them shake his hand outside factory gates at sunrise. Earlier that night in Cambridge over dinner at a bogus Mexican restaurant run by Italian junkies, several people who asked me why I was wasting my time on this kind of bullshit, McGovern, Muskie, Lindsay, or even Gene McCarthy had I had just come back from a long day at the Massachusetts Radlib Caucus in Worcester, billed as a statewide rally to decide which Democratic candidates support in the Massachusetts primary on April the 25th. The idea said the organizers was to unify and avoid a disastrous vote-splitting orgy that would be that would splinter the left between McGovern, Lindsay, and McCarthy, thus guaranteeing an easy musky win. The caucus organizers were said to be well-known McCarthy supporters who had conceived the gathering as a sort of launching pad for Gene in 72. And McCarthy seemed to agree. He was the only candidate to attend the caucus in person, and his appearance drew a booming ovation that gave every indication of a pending victory. The night before, at a crowded student rally in Hogan Student Center at Holy Cross, McCarthy had responded to a questioner who asked if he was really a serious candidate by saying, You'll see how serious I am after tomorrow's caucus. Caucus! The crowd at Holy Cross responded with a rolling cheer. The median age that night was somewhere around 19, and McCarthy was impressively sharp and confident as he drew roar after roar of applause with his quietly vicious attack on Nixon, Humphrey, and Muskie. As I stood there in the doorway of the auditorium, looking across the shoulders of the overflow crowd, it looked like 1968 all over again. There was a definite sense of drama in seeing McCarthy back on the stump, cranking up another crusade. But that high didn't last long. The side of Saturday's caucus was a gym at Assumption College across town, and the crowd over there was very different. The median age of the caucus was more like 33, and the results of the first ballot were a staggering blow to McCarthy's newborn crusade. McGovern cleaned up, beating McCarthy almost 3-1. to one. When the final tally came in after more than eight hours of infighting, McGovern's quietly efficient grass roots organizers had locked up 62% of the vote, leaving McCarthy to split the rest more or less equally with Shirley Chisholm. Both Muskie and Lindsay had tried to ignore the caucus, claiming it was stacked against them, and as a result, neither one got enough votes to even mention. The outcome of the Massachusetts Radlib caucus was a shock to almost everybody except the busloads of McGovern supporters who had come there to flex their muscle in public for the first time. McCarthy, who had left early to fly back to Washington for an appearance the next day on Meet the Press, was seriously jolted by the loss. He showed it the next morning on TV when he looked like a ball of bad nerves caught in the crossfire of hostile questions from Roger Mudd and George Herman. He was clearly off balance, a nervous shadow of the rising tide, hammerhead spoiler he had been on Friday night for the rally at Holy Cross. To make things worse, one of the main organizers of the Radlib Caucus was Jerry Grossman, a wealthy envelope manufacturer from Newton in the Boston suburbs and a key McCarthy fundraiser in the 68 campaign. But after the Radlib Caucus, Grossman went far out of his way along with Mudd and Herman to make sure McCarthy was done for. He immediately endorsed McGovern, saying it was clear that Massachusetts liberals no longer believe in McCarthy's leadership quotient. What this meant, according to the unanimous translation by political pros and press wizards, was McCarthy won't get any more of Grossman's money. Grossman ignored the obvious fact that he and other pro-McCarthy heavies had been beaten stupid on the grassroots organizing level by an unheralded McGovern machine put together in Massachusetts by John Ruther, a nephew of Walter, late president of the UAW. I spent most of that afternoon wandering around the gym, listening to people talk and watching the action. It was absolutely clear once the voting started that Ruther had everything wired. Everywhere I went, there was a local McGovern floor manager keeping people in line, telling them exactly what was happening and what would probably happen next, while the McCarthy forces, led by veteran Kennedy Camelot Field Marshal Richard Godwin, became more and more demoralized, caught the fast-rising pizzers movement between a surprisingly organized McGovern block on the right and a wild-eyed Chisholm 
uprising on the left. Their chosen strength shocked everybody. She was one of 12 names on the ballot, which included almost con every conceivable Democratic candidate from Hubert Humphrey to Patsy Mink, Wilbur Mills, and Sam Yorty. But after Muskie and Lindsay dropped out, the caucus was billed far and wide as a test between McGovern and McCarthy. There was no mention in the press or anywhere else that some unknown black woman from Brooklyn might seriously challenge these famous liberal heavies on their own turf. But when the final vote came in, Shirley Chisholm had actually beaten Gene McCarthy, who finished a close third. The Chisholm challenge was a last-minute ideal and only half-organized on the morning of the caucus by a handful of speedy young black politicos and women's lib types. But by 6 o'clock that evening, it had developed from a noisy ideal into a solid power block. What began as a symbolic kind of challenge became a serious position after the first ballot. Among this overwhelmingly white, liberal, affluent, well-educated, and over-30 audience, when almost half of them refused to vote for George McGovern because he seemed too conventional. As one, as one long-haired kid in a ski parka told me, they had nothing against McGovern. They agreed with almost everything he said, but they wanted more. And it is interesting to speculate about what might have happened if the same people had showed up at the McCarthy's Holy Cross rally on Friday night had come out for assumption on Sunday. There were not many youth freak vote types at the Rad Lib Caucus. Perhaps one out of five, and probably not even that. The bulk of the crowd looked like professors on the wives from Amherst. One of the problems, according to a bushy young radical talking non-student from Boston, was that you had to pay a registration fee of two dollars before you got a vote. Shit, he said. I wouldn't pay it myself, so I can't, so I can't vote. He shrugged. But this caucus doesn't mean anything anyway. This is just a bunch of old liberals getting their rocks off. That's how we feel about the DNC right now. Uh, any of y'all at that Rage Against the Machine riot at the DNC in Los Angeles back in 2000? That was literally the first week I got to Los Angeles. It was a real fun howdy-do. My first smell of tear gas. <sighs> Anyway, where were we? A little romp down memory lane. Manchester, New Hampshire is a broken down mill town on the Merrimack River with an aggressive chamber of commerce and America's worst newspaper. There's not much else to say for it except that Manchester is a welcome change from Washington, D.C. I checked into the Wayfarer just before dawn and tried to get some music on my high powered waterproof Sony. But there was nothing worth listening to, not even out of Boston or Cambridge, so I slept a few hours, then joined the McGovern Caravan for a tour of the Booth Fisheries in Portsmouth. It was a wonderful experience. We stood near the time clock as a shift changed, and McGovern did his hand-grabbing thing, and there was no way to avoid him. So the workers shuffled by and tried to be polite, and McGovern was blocking the approach to the drinking fountain above, which hung a sign saying, Dip hands in, hand solution before returning to work. The place was like a big aircraft hangar full of fish with a strange, cold, gaseous haze hanging over everything, and a lot of hissing and humming from the fish-packing machines on the assembly line. I've always liked seafood, but after 30 minutes in that place, I lost my appetite for it. The next drill was the official opening of the new McGovern headquarters in Dover, where a large crowd of teenagers and middle-class liberals were gathered to meet the candidate. This age pattern seemed to prevail at every one of McGovern's public appearances. The crowds were always a mix of people either under 20 or over 40. The meaning of this age gap didn't hit me until I looked back at my notes and saw how consistent it was. <clears throat> Even at the Massachusetts Raz Razlib Caucus, where I guessed the medium age to be 33, that figure was a rough mathematical compromise rather than the physical description. <clears throat> in both Massachusetts and New Hampshire, the McGovern and McCarthy crowds were noticeably barren of people between 25 and 35. After Dover, the next speech was scheduled for the main auditorium, at the Exeter Academy for Boys, an exclusive prep school about 25 miles up the road. The schedule showed a two-hour break for dinner at the Exeter Inn, <clears throat> where the McGovern Press Party took over about half the dining room. I can't recommend the food at that place because they wouldn't let me eat. The only other person barred from the dining room that night was Tim Krause from the Rolling Stone Bureau in Boston. Neither one of us was acceptably dressed, they said. No ties, no three-button herringbone jackets. So we had to wait in the bar with James J. Kilpatrick, the famous crypto-Nazi newspaper columnist. He made no attempt to sit, sit with us, but he made sure that everybody in the room knew exactly who he was. He kept calling the bartender, Jim, 
which was not his name, and the bartender, becoming more and more nervous, began addressing Kilpatrick as Mr. Reynolds. <laughs> Finally, Kilpatrick lost his tipper. My name's not Reynolds, goddammit, I'm James J. Kilpatrick of the Washington Evening Star. Then he hauled his paunch off the chair and reeled out of the lobby. The Exeter stop was not a happy one for McGovern, because word had just come in from Frank Mankiewicz, his political director in Washington, and McGovern's old friend and staunch liberal ally from Iowa, Senator Harold Hughes, had just announced he was endorsing Ed, Mus Ed Muskie. This news hit the campaign caravan like a dung bomb. Hughes had been one of the few senators that McGovern was counting on to hang tough. The Hughes, McGovern, Fred Harris, Democrat of Oklahoma, Axis, had been the closest thing in the Senate to a populist power block for the past two years. Even the Muskie endorsement hustlers who were crisscrossing the nation, putting pressure on local politicians to come out for Big Ed, hadn't bothered with Hughes because they considered him untouchable. If anything, he was thought to be more radical and intransigent than McGovern himself. Hughes had grown a beard. He didn't mind admitting that he talked to trees now and then. And a few months earlier, I challenged the party hierarchy by forcing a public showdown between himself and Larry O'Brien's personal choice for the chairmanship of the all-important credentials committee at the National Convention. Duke Dougherty, a former Los Angeles Times newsman who was handling McGovern's national press action in New Hampshire, was so shaken by the news of Hughes' defection that he didn't even try to explain it when reporters began asking why. Doherty had just gotten the word when the crowded press limo left over for Exeter, and he did his best to fend off our questions until he could talk to the candidate and agree on what to say. But in terms of campaign morale, it was as if somebody had slashed all the tires on every car in the caravan, including the candidates. When we got to the Exeter Inn, I half expected to see a filthy bearded raven perched over the entrance, croaking, Nevermore! By chance, I found George downstairs in the men's room, hovering into a urinal, staring straight ahead at the gray marble tiles. Say, uh, I hate to mention this, he said. I said. But what was this thing with Hughes? He flinched, quickly zipped his pants up, shaking his hand and fumbling something about a deal for the vice presidency. I could see that he didn't want to talk about it, but I wanted to get his reaction before he and Dory could put a story together. Why do you, th why do you think he said? Why do you think he did it? I said. He was washing his hands, staring down at the sink. Well, he said finally. I guess I shouldn't say this, Hunter, but I honestly don't know. I'm surprised. We're all surprised. He looked very tired, and I didn't see much point in prodding him to say anything else about what was clear clearly a painful subject. We walked upstairs together, but I stopped at the desk to get a newspaper while I went into the dining room. This proved to be my undoing because the doorkeeper would no doubt have welcomed me very politely if I had entered with a senator, but as it happened, I was shunted off to the bar with Krauss and James J. Kilpatrick, who was wearing a vest and a blue pinstripe suit. A lot had been written about McGovern's difficulties in the campaign trail, but most of it far off the point. The queer polls and press wizards say he simply lacks charisma, but that's a cheap and simplistic idea that is more an insult to the electorate than to McGovern. The assholes who run politics in this country have become so mesmerized by the Madison Avenue School of Campaigning that they actually believe now that all it takes to become a congressman or a senator or even a president is a nice set of teeth, a big wad of money, and a half dozen media specialists. The government, they say, doesn't make it on this level, which is probably true, but McCarthy was worse. His 68 campaign had none of the surface necessities. He had no money, no press, no endorsements, no camera presence. His only asset was a good eye for the opening and a good enough ear to pick up the distant rumble of a groundswell with nobody riding it. There is nothing in McGovern's campaign so far to suggest that he understands this kind of thing. For all his integrity, he is still talking to the politics of the past. He is still naive enough to assume that anybody who is honest and intelligent with a good voting record on the issues is a natural man for the White House. But this is stone bullshit. There are only two ways to make it in big make it in big time politics today one is to come on like a mean dinosaur with a high powered machine that scares the shit out of your entrenched opponent like Daly or Nixon and the other is to tap the massive frustrated energy of a mainly young disillusioned electorate that has long since abandoned the idea that we all have a duty to vote this is like being told you have a duty to buy a new car but you have to choose immediately between a Ford and a Chevy 
But Govern's failure to understand this is what brought people like Lindsay and McCarthy and Shirley Chisholm into the campaign. They all sent an untouched constituency, Chisholm's campaign manager, a sleek young Pole from Kansas named Jerry Robinson, calls it the sleeping giant vote. Nobody's reaching them, he said. You've got a lot of people out there with nobody they think they can vote for. Ron Dellums, the black congressman from Ber Berkeley, called it the inward vote. But he wasn't talking about skin pigment. It's time for somebody to lead all of America's inwards, he said at the Capitol Hill press conference when Shirley Chisholm announced she was running for president. And by this I mean the young, the black, the brown, the women, the poor, all the people who feel left out of the political process. If we can put the inward vote together, we can bring about some real change in this country. Dillums is probably the only elected official in America who feels politically free enough to stare at the cameras and make a straight-faced pitch to the in vote. But he is also enough of a politician to know what's out there. Maybe not the Exeter Inn, but the hills north and west of Manchester are teeming with inns. They didn't turn out for the speech-making, and they probably won't vote in the primary. But they are there, and there are a hell of a lot of them. Looking back on that week in New Hampshire, it was mainly a matter of following George McGovern around and watching him do his thing, which was pleasant, or at least vaguely uplifting, though not what you'd call a real jerk around. McGovern is not one of your classic fireballs on the stump. His campaign workers in New Hampshire seem vaguely addicted by a sense of uncertainty about what it all means. They are very decent people. They are working hard. They are very sincere. Most of them are young re volunteers who get their pay in room and board, but they lack something crucial. And that lack is painfully obvious to anybody who remembers the mood of the McCarthy volunteers in 1968. Those people were angry. The other side of that clean for Gene coin was a nervous sense of truce that hung over the New Hampshire campaign. In backroom late night talks at the Wayfair, there was no shortage of McCarthy staffers who said this would probably be their final trip within the system. There was some who didn't mind admitting that personally they had rather throw firebombs and get heavy into dope, but they were attracted by the drama, the sheer balls of McCarthy's hopeless challenge. McCarthy's national freshman at the time was Seymour Hirsch, who quit the campaign in Wisconsin and called Gene a closet racist. Two years later, Cy Hirsch was back in the public ear with a story about a place called My Lai in South Vietnam. It was the one who dragged it out. He was the one who dragged it out into the open. McCarthy's state-level press man that year was a hair freak named Bill Gallagher, Gallagher, who kept his, by the way, I want to hear about the, the village of My Lai, the massacre of uh, when the American soldiers went and just started shooting women and children. Um, just burning villages outright with flamethrowers. <clears throat> I have a, I had a client one time who was in that war, and he was the only one of the only people who fired back at his own officer. Thank God for for heroes, some to get on some. I think after he is deceased, I'll write a song about him. If I don't decease first, the rate all this stuff is going, we might end up with a whole uh, what 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 have you? The uh, revolution in uh, Chile, South America, where the uh, fascist uh, dictator killed all of the uh, organizers in the opposing party the very next day. He was backed by the CIA when he did it. That is no lie. Pinochet is his name. Well, like the sign on the gate says, this premises is protected by armed socialists. Burglars will be given food, aid, and socialist literature. Fascists will be shot on sight. Looking back on that week in New Hampshire, it was mainly a matter of following George McGovern around and watching him do his thing, which was pleasant, or at least vaguely uplifting, but not what you'd call a real jerk around. Oh yes, my lie. McCarthy's 
state-level press man that year was a hair freak named Bill Gallagher, who kept his room in the Wayfair open from midnight to dawn as a sort of all-night refuge for weed fanciers. As a, as a year a year later, when I returned to New Hampshire to write a piece on ski racer Jean-Claude Keeley, I got off the cocktail circuit long enough to locate Gallagher in a small Vermont hamlet where he was living as the de facto head of a mini-commune. He had dropped out of politics with a vengeance. His beard was down to his belt and his head was far out of politics. The McCarthy thing had been a bad trip, he explained. He no longer cared who was president. You don't find people like Kirsch and Gallagher around McGovern's headquarters in Manchester this year. They would frighten the staff. They would frighten the staff. McGovern's main man in New Hampshire is a fat young Pole named Joe, Joe Grand Mason, Grand Maison, whose personal style hovers somewhere between that of a state trooper and a used car salesman. Grand Maison was eager to nail Muskie. If we elect a president who three years ago said, gee, I made a mistake, well, I think it's about time these people were held accountable for those mistakes. Indeed. Grand Mason backed away from me like he had stepped on a rattlesnake when I asked him if it were true that he had been a Johnson delegate to the Chicago Convention in 68. We met at a McGovern cocktail party in a downstate hamlet called Keene. Let's talk about this word accountable, I said. I get the feeling you stepped in shit on that one. What do you mean, he snapped. Just because I was a Johnson delegate doesn't mean anything. I'm not running for office. Good, I said. We were standing in a short hallway between the kitchen and the living room where McGovern was saying, The thing the political bosses want more is for young people to drop out because they know the young people can change the system and the bosses don't want any change. True enough, I thought. But how do you change the system by hiring a young fogey like Grand Mason to wire up your act in New, New Hampshire? With a veteran Judas goat like that in charge of the operation, it's no wonder that McGovern's Manchester headquarters is full of people who talk like nervous poli sci students on job leave. Joe didn't feel like discussing his gig at the 68 convention, which is understandable. If I had done a thing like that, I wouldn't want to talk about it either. I tried to change the subject, but he crammed a handful of potato chips into his mouth and walked away. Later that night after the cocktail party, we drove out to the student union hall at the Keene Keene State College, where McGovern addressed a big and genuinely friendly crowd of almost 3,000, jammed into a hall meant for 2,000 tops. The advanced man had done his work well. The big question tonight was amnesty. And when McGovern said he was for it, the crowd came alive. This was, after all, the first time any active candidate for the presidency had said yes on the amnesty question, which is beginning to look like a time bomb with almost as much spoiler potential as a, as a busing issue. They both have long and tangled roots, but it's hard to imagine any question in American politics today that could have more long-range impact than the argument over amnesty, which is nothing more or less than a proposal to grant presidential pardon to all draft dodgers and U.S. military deserters on the grounds that history has absolved them. Because of the Vietnam War was wrong from the start, as even Nixon has tacitly admitted, then it is hard to avoid the logic of the argument that says the anti-war exiles were right for refusing to fight in it. There is not much room for politics in the amnesty argument. It boils down to an official admission that the American military establishment acting in spiritual concert with the White House and the national business community was wrong. There is not much room for politics in the amnesty argument. It boils down to an official admission that the American military establishment acting in spiritual consort with the White House and the national business community was wrong. Just thought that needed to be said twice. Almost everybody except Joe Alsop had already admitted this in private, but it is going to be a very painful thing to say in public. It will be especially painful to the people who got their sons shipped back to them in rubber sacks and to the thousands of young vets who got their arms and their legs and balls blown off for what the White House and Ed Muskie now admit was a mistake. But 60,000 Americans have died for that mistake along with several million Vietnamese. And it's only now becoming clear that the war dead will also include hundreds of thousands of Cambodians, Laotians, and Thais. When this war goes into the history books, the United States Air Force will rank as the most efficient gang of murderers in the history of man. 
Richard Nixon is flatly opposed to a general amnesty for the men who refused to fight this tragic war. Muskie agrees, but he says he might change his mind once the war ends, and Lindsay, as usual, is both for and against it. The only candidates in favor of amnesty are McGovern and Ted Kennedy. I watched McGovern deal with a question when it popped out of that overflow student audience at Keene State. He was talking very sharp, very confident, and when the question of amnesty came up, he got right on it, saying, Yes, I'm in favor. This provided a nice outburst of cheers and applause, and it was a very strong statement, and the students clearly dug it. Then moments later, somebody tossed out the fish hook, asking McGovern if he had any plans pro or con about supporting Muskie if Big Ed got the nod in Miami. McGovern paused, shifted uneasily for a second or so at the podium, then said, Yes, I'm inclined to that position. I was standing behind him on the stage, looking out at the crowd through a slit in the big velvet curtain, and according to the red ink speed scrawl in my notebook, the audience responded with, No cheering, confused silence. The audience seems to sag. But these were only my notes. Perhaps I was wrong. Even making a certain allowance for my own bias, it still seems perfectly logical to assume that an audience of first-time voters might be at least momentarily confused by a left champion Democrat candidate who says in one breath that his opponent is dead wrong on a very crucial issue, and then in the next breath says he plans to support that opponent if he wins the nomination. I doubt if I was the only person in the hall at that moment who thought, well, shit, if you plan to support him in July, why not support him now and get over with it? Moments later, the speech ended, and I found myself out on the <clears throat> moments later the speech ended and I found myself out on the sidewalk shooting up with Ray Morgan, a veteran political analyst from the Kansas City Star. He was on his way to the airport with McGovern for a quick flight on the charter plane to Washington and he urged me to join him. But I didn't feel up to it. I feel like thinking for a, I felt like thinking for a while, running that narrow icy little highway back to Manchester just as fast as the cougar would make it and still hold the road, which was not very fast so I had plenty of time to brood and to wonder why I felt so depressed. I had not come to New Hampshire with any illusions about McGovern or his trip, which was, after all, a long shot underdog challenge that even the people running his campaign said was not much better than 30 to 1. What depressed me, I think, was that McGovern was the only alternative available this time around, and I was sorry I couldn't step up for it. I agree with everything he said, but I wished he would say a lot more or maybe something different. Ideas, specifics, programs, etc. Well, that would take a lot of time and space I don't have now, but for openers, I think maybe it is no longer enough to have been against the war in Vietnam since 1963, especially when your name is not one of the two senators who voted against the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution in 1964, and when you're talking to people who got their first taste of tear gas or anti-war rallies in places like Berkeley and Cambridge in early 65. A lot of blood has gone under the bridge since then, and we have all learned a hell of a lot about the re realities of politics in America. Even the politicians have learned. But as usual, the politicians are much slower than the people they want to lead. This is an ugly portent for the 25 million or so new voters between 18 and 25 who may or may not vote in 1972. And many of them probably will vote. The ones who go to the polls in 72 will be the most committed, the most idealistic, the best minds of my generation as Ginsburg said 14 years ago in Howell. There is not much doubt that the hustlers behind the youth vote will get a lot of people out to the polls in 72. If you give 25 million people a new toy, and odds are pretty good that a lot of them will try it at least once. But what about next time? Who's going to explain in 1976 that all the people who felt they got burned in 72 should try again for another bogus challenger? Four years from now, there will be two entire generations between the ages of 22 and 40, he will not give a hoot in hell about any election, and their apathy will be rooted in personal experience. Four years from now, it will be very difficult to convince anybody who has gone from Johnson Goldwater to Humphrey Nixon to Nixon Muskie that there is any possible reason for getting involved in another bullshit election. This is the gibberish that churned in my head on the drive back from Manchester. Every now and then I would pass a car with New Hampshire plates and the motto, Live Free or Die, inscribed above the numbers. The highways are full of good mottos, but T.S. Eliot put them all in a sack when he coughed up that line about, what was it? Have these dangerous drugs fucked my memory? Maybe so, but I think it went something like this. Between the idea and the reality. 
falls the shadow. The shadow? I could almost smell the bastard behind me when I made the last turn into Manchester. It was late Tuesday night and tomorrow's schedule was calm. All the candidates had zipped, candidates had zipped off to Florida except for Sam Yorty. They didn't feel ready for that. The next day around noon, I drove down to Boston. The only hitchhiker I saw was an 18-year-old kid with long black hair who was going to Reading, or Reading, as he said it. But when I asked him who he planned to vote for in the election, he looked at me like I'd said something crazy. What election? He asked. Never mind, I said. I was only kidding. One of the favorite parlor games in left liberal circles, from Beverly Hills to Chevy Chase to the Upper East Side in Cambridge, has been for more than a year now a sort of guilty have public <clears throat> breastfeeding whenever George McGovern's name is mentioned. He has become the Willie Loman of the left. He is liked, but not well enough, but not well liked. And his failure to make the big charismatic breakthrough has made him the despair of his friends. They can't figure it out. Bernie would have won by now. Bernie would have won by now. Bernie would have won by now. Y'all doomed to hear me say that a few times today. Where was I? A few weeks ago, I drove over to Chevy Chase to the white side of Rock Creek Park to have dinner with McGovern and a few of his heavier friends. The idea was to have a small, loose-talking dinner and let George relax after a week on the stump in New Hampshire. He arrived looking tired and depressed. Somebody handed him a drink, and he slumped down on the couch, not saying much, but listening intently as the talk quickly turned to the McGovern problem. For more than a year now, he's been saying all the right things, but he's been publicly, he has been publicly opposed to the war in Vietnam since 1963. He's for amnesty now. His, alternatively, his alternative military spending budget would cut Pentagon money back to less than half of what Nixon proposes for 1972. Beyond that, McGovern has had the balls to go into Florida and say that if he gets elected, he will probably pull the plug on the $5 billion space shuttle program, thereby croaking thousands of new jobs in the already depressed Cape Kennedy, Central Florida area. He has refused to modify his stand on the school busing issue, which Nixon and strategists say will be the number one campaign argument by midsummer. One of, these, one of those wild-eyed fire and brimstone issues that scares the piss out of the politicians because there's no way to dodge, there's no way to dodge it. But McGovern went out of his way to make sure people understood he was for busing, not because it's desirable, but because it's among the prices we are paying for a century of segregation in our housing patterns. This is not the kind of thing people want to hear in a general election year, especially not if you happen to be unemployed, anti-gravity systems engineer with a deadhead mortgage on a house near Orlando or a Polish mill worker in Milwaukee with three kids the federal government wants to haul across town every morning to a school full of inwards. McGovern is the only major candidate, including Lindsay and Muskie, who invariably gives a straight answer when people raise these questions. He lines out the painful truth and his reward has been just about the same as that of any other politician who insists on telling the truth. He is mocked, vilified, ignored, and abandoned as a hopeless loser by even his good old buddies like Harold Hughes. On the face of it, the McGovern problem looks like the ultimate proof positive for the liberal cynic's conviction that there is no room in American politics for an honest man, which is probably true. If you take it for granted all, with, along with McGovern and most of his backers, that American politics is synonymous with the traditional two-party system, the Democrats and the Republicans, the ins and the outs, the party in power and the loyal opposition. That's the term National Democratic Chairman Larry O'Brien has decided to go with this year. He says he can't, for the life of him, understand why demo party headquarters from coast to coast aren't bursting at the seams with dewy-eyed young voters completely stoned on the latest party message. Open letter, message to O'Brien. Well, Larry, I really hate to lay this on you, because we used to be buddies, right? This was back in the days when I bought all those white shark skin suits because I thought I was going to be the next governor of American Samoa. You strung me along, Larry. You conned me into buying all those goddamn white suits and kept me hanging around that Holiday Inn in Pierre, South Dakota, waiting for my confirmation to come through, Larry. But it never did, Larry. I was never appointed. You bushwhacked me. But what the hell? 
I've never been one to hold a grudge any longer than absolutely necessary, and I wouldn't want you to think I'd hold that kind of cheap treachery against you now that you're running the party, the loyal opposition, as it were. You and Hubert, along with Muskie and Jackson and Mad Sam Yorty and Wilbur Mills, and yes, even Lindsay McGovern. Party loyalty is the name of the game, right? George, Meany, Frank Rizzo, Mayor Daly. Well, shucks, what can I say, Larry? I'm still for that gig in Samoa or anywhere else where the sun shines because they still have those stinking white suits. And I'm beginning to think seriously in terms of foreign travel around the end of this year, maybe November. Under different circumstances, Larry, I might try to press you on this, maybe lean on you just a trifle for an appointment to the Drugs and Politics Bureau desk at our outpost in the Canary Islands. My friend Cardoza, the retired dean of Gonzo Journalism, just spot a jazz bar out there, and he says it's a very weird place. But shit, Larry, why kid ourselves? You're not going to be in a position to appoint anybody to anything when November comes down on us. You won't even have a job. Or if you do, it'll be one of those gigs where you'll have to get your half salary and gold bullions. Because the way it looks now, the Democratic Party won't be issuing a hell of a lot of certified checks after November 7th. Remember the Whigs, Larry? They went belly up with no warning at all. When a handful of young politicians like Abe Lincoln decided to move out on their own and fuck the Whigs, which worked out very nicely. And when it became almost instantly clear that the Whigs' hierarchy was just a gang of old impotent windbags with no real power at all, the party just curled up and died. And any politician stupid enough to stay loyal went down with the DNC ship. <laughs> Am I the only one who's completely done with the DNC after this election? Yeah, I'll let the chips fall where they may after this. I'm going to put my energy into a third party. Because life on earth is dying too fast for these gradual solutions. According to my friends at JPL, which is also one of the sources of my PTSD. You know, when you find out that there's a 50% chance that humans won't be here at all, in three generations? If that don't give you, give you the PTSD, I don't know what will. When the disease becomes prevalent enough back in Kentucky, they put the in front of it. I remember, uh, you know, back in the old days, it was like the consumption and the herpes. And uh, in the 80s when my uh, queer uncle from San Francisco came down with the AIDS. Punishment from God, the family said. A bunch of assholes worshiping an asshole God, apparently. The Gnostic theologians knew that the God of organized religion is the demiurge out of Baal, the deceiver, the petty, angry, violent, ignorant demiurge of whom Trump is the human form. You have been deceived, my southern brothers and sisters. When I knew you back in the river bottoms of western Kentucky, my brothers and sisters, you stood against the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, as you would say in your sermons. And now you fully embraced them. Maybe the Holiness Pentecostals are right when they referred to the television as the old devil box. They were wrong about marijuana, though. It really does make things better. Unless, you know, you have predisposition towards psychosis. <laughs> okay. Which, thankfully, I don't. And it is important to know your strain and the grower have a personal relationship with that stuff. 
Sorry, Grown is the best. I guess in some ways it might be against the cannabis industry for the same reasons I'm against any industry. This is, a, this is the soft under, underbelly of the McGovern problem. He's really just another good Democrat, and the only thing that sets him apart from the others is a hard, almost masochistic kind of honesty that drives him around the country, running up huge bills and turning people off. We are not a nation of truth lovers. McGovern understands this, but he keeps on saying these terrible things anyway. Now, after watching him in New Hampshire for a while, I found myself wondering to a point that bothered now and then on quiet anguish, that bordered now and then on quiet anguish, just what the hell it was about the man that left me politically numb, despite the fact that I agreed with everything he said. I spent about two weeks brooding on this because I like McGovern, which still surprises me. Because politicians like journalists are pretty hard people to like. The only other people I've ever dealt with who struck me as being essentially meaner than politicians are tight ends and pro football. There's not much difference in basic temperament between a good tight end and a successful politician. They will both go down in the pit and do whatever has to be done, then come up smiling and occasionally licking blood off their teeth. Gene Big Daddy Lipscomb was not a tight end, but he had the same instincts. The Baltimore Colts paid Gene to mash quarterbacks, and failing that, to crack collarbones and make people deaf. Shortly before he OD'd on smack, Big Daddy explained his technique to a lunchtime crowd of Rotarians. I always go straight for the head, he explained. Whoever's across from me, I bash him with the flat part of my hand, nail him square on the ear hole of his helmet about five straight times. Pretty soon he gets so nervous he can't concentrate and he can't even hear the signals. Once I get him spooked, the rest is easy. There is a powerful fascination that attaches to this kind of efficiency, and it is worth remembering that Kennedy won the 1960 Democratic nomination not by appealing to the higher and finer consciousness of the delegates, but by laying the stomp and the whip song on Adlai Stevenson's people when the deal went down in Los Angeles. The Kennedy machine was so good that even Mayor Daley came round. A good politician can smell the hammer coming down like an old sailor smells a squall behind the sun. But Daley is not acting this year like a man who smells the hammer. When George McGovern went to pay a courtesy call on Daley last month, the mayor's advice was, go out and win an election, then come back and see me. McGovern and his earnest liberal advisors don't like to talk about that visit. No more than Muskie and his people enjoy talking about Big Ed's courtesy call on Super Cop, Frank Rizzo, the new mayor of Philadelphia. But these are the men with the muscle. They can swing a lot of votes. Or at least that's what the conventional wisdom says. Daily Rizzo, George Meadey, and the good old boys, the kingmakers. But there is the flaw in McGovern. When the big whistle blows, he's still a party man. Ten years ago, the electorate saw nothing wrong with the spectacle of two men fighting savagely for the party nomination, calling each other whores and traitors and thieves, all the way up to balloting time at the convention and then miraculously coming together, letting bygones be bygones, to confront the common foe, the other party. But the electorate has different tastes now, and that kind of honky-tonk bullshit doesn't make it anymore. Back in 1960, most Americans still believed that whoever lived in the White House was naturally a righteous and upstanding man. Otherwise, he wouldn't be there. This was after 28 years of Roosevelt and Eisenhower, who were very close to God. Harry Truman, who lived a little closer to the devil, was viewed more as an accident than a real president. The shit train began on November 22, 1963 in Dallas, when some twisted little geek blew the president's head off. And then a year earlier, LBJ was re-elected as the peace candidate. Johnson did a lot of rotten things in those five bloody years. But when the history books are written, he will emerge in his proper role as the man who caused an entire generation of Americans to lose all respect for the presidency. The White House, the Army, and in fact, the whole structure of government. And then came 1968, the year that somehow managed to confirm almost everybody's worst fears about the future of the Republic. And then to wrap it all up, another cheap jack hustler moved into the White House. If Joe McGinnis had written the selling of the president about good old Ike, he'd have been chased down the streets of New York by angry mobs. Then when he wrote it about Nixon, people just shrugged and said, yeah, it's a goddamn shame, and if it's true, but so what? I went to Nixon's inauguration. Washington was a sea of mud and freezing rain. As an inaugural parade neared the, the corner of 16th and Pennsylvania Avenue, some freak threw a half-gallon wine jug at the convertible carrying the commandment of the Mar carrying the uh, commandant of the Marine Corps. And as one time presidential candidate George Romney passed by in his new role as Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, the mob on the sidewalk began chanting, Romney eats shit! Romney eats shit! 
Romney eats shit. Romney eats shit. George tried to ignore it. He knew the TV cameras were on him, so he curled his mouth up in a hideous smile and kept waving at the crowd. Even as they continued to chant, Romney eats shit. Romney eats shit. George tried to ignore it. The mood of the crowd was decidedly ugly. You couldn't walk 50 feet without blundering into a fist fight. The high point of the parade, of course, was the moment when the new president's car passed by. But it was hard to be sure which one it was. The Secret Service sent a few decoys down the line from time to time, apparently to confuse the snipers and maybe draw some fire. But nothing serious happened. Just a normal hill of rocks, beer cans, and wine bottles. So they figured it was safe to run the president through. Nixon came by, according to the TV, made and what appeared to be a sort of huge, hollowed-out cannonball on wheels. It was a very nasty-looking armored car, and God only knows who was actually inside. I was standing next to the CBS TV reporter named Joe Binti, and I heard him say, Here comes the president. How do you know? I asked him. It was just barely possible to detect a hint of human movement through the slits that passed for windows. The president is weaving to the waving to the crowd, said Binti in his mic. Bullshit, said Lennox Raphael, standing beside me. That's Neil Cassidy in there. Who? said Binti. Never mind, I said. He can't hear you anyway. That car has a vacuum seal. Binti stared at me, then moved away. Shortly afterward, he quit his job and took his family to Copenhagen. Can you picture that? Neil Cassidy who drove the acid bus of Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters behind the wheel of the presidential motorcade? That would be absolutely glorious. Okay, where were we? When the goat scorner comes to list the main donors of our time, the Nixon inauguration will have to be ranked number one. Altamont was a nightmare. Chicago was worse. Kent State so bad that it's still hard to find the right words for it. But there was at least a brief flash of hope in those scenes, a wild kind of momentary high before the shroud came down. The Nixon inauguration is the only public spectacle I've ever dealt with that was a king hell bummer from start to finish. There was a stench of bedrock finality about it. Standing there on Pennsylvania Avenue, watching our pres new president roll by in his black armored hearse, surrounded by a trotting phalanx of Secret Service men with their hands in the air, batting away the garbage thrown out of the hum thrown out to the crowd. I found myself wondering how Lee felt at a Potomox or, or the main Jap Admiral, Admiral when they took him out to the battleship Missouri to sign the final papers. Right. Checked into the pit house and had the tailor send up a gallon of rum and ten yards of the best Irish silk. I need a tailor made free falls free falling suit just in case they invite me down to Caracas for the races. Charge it to Clifford Irving. While you're at it, my man, send up a pair of white alligator neck shoes and an Arab to toe polish to and an Arab to polish the windows. I mean to cover this Florida primary in depth. New Hampshire was well. What was it? On the plane back from Boston, I scanned the New York Times and found that James Reston, as always, had his teeth right down to the bone. After all, he wrote, there are hard and honest differences between the candidates and the parties over the best terms of peace and trade and the allocations of limited resources to the competing claims of military security abroad and civil order and social security at home. This is really what the presidential campaign is all about. Reston is narrow, but he has a good eye when it's focused. And in this case, he seems to be right. The 72 presidential campaign is looking more and more like a backroom squabble between bankers, generals, and labor bosses. There's no indication at this time that the outcome will make much difference to anyone else. If the Republicans win, we will immediately declare limited nuclear war on all of Indochina, and the IRS will, and the IRS will start collecting a 20% national sales tax on every dollar spent by anybody for the national defense emergency. But if the Democrats win, Congress will begin a 14-year debate on whether or not to declare massive conventional war on all of Indochina, and the IRS will begin collecting a 20% national loser's tax on all economy incomes under 25000 per annum for the national defense emergency. The most recent Gallup poll says Nixon and Muskie are running head-to-head, -head, but on closer examination, the figures had Muskie trailing by a bare 1%, so he quickly resigned his membership in the Caucasians' only congressional country club in the horsey, suburb, in the horsey suburbs near Cabin John, Maryland. He made this painful move in late January, about the same time he began hammering Nixon's in-the-war proposal. Watching Muskie on TV that week, I remember the words of ex-Senator Ernest Gruning, Democrat from Alaska, 
when he appeared at the Massachusetts Rad Lib Caucus in his role at the, as the official spokesman for McGovern. Bruning was one of the two senators who voted against the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution in 1964, the resolution that gave LBG carte blanche to do everything necessary to win the war in Vietnam. Wayne Morse of Oregon was the only other nay vote, and both Bruning and Morse were defeated when they ran for re-election in 1966. And Worcester, Ernie Bruning, approached the stage like a slow-moving golem. He is 85 years old, and his legs are not real springy. But when he got behind the podium, he spoke like the Grim Reaper. I've known Ed Muskie for many years, he said. I've considered him a friend, but I can't help remembering that for all those years, while we were getting deeper and deeper into that war, and while more and more boys were dying, Ed Muskie stayed silent. Bruning neglected to say where McGovern had been on the day of the Tonkin Gulf vote, but I remembered somebody saying up on the press platform near the roof of the Assumption Column Gym that I can forgive McGovern for blowing that Tonkin thing because the Pentagon lied. And what's his excuse for not voting against that goddamn wiretapping bill? The Omnibus Safe Streets and Crime Control Act of 1968, a genuinely oppressive piece of legislation? Even Lyndon Johnson was shocked by it, but he couldn't quite bring himself to veto the bugger. For the same reasons cited by the many senators who called the bill frightening while refusing to vote against it, because they didn't want to be on record as having voted against safe streets, quote-unquote, and crime control, quote-unquote. The bare handful of senators who actually voted against the bill explained themselves in very ominous terms. For details, see Justice by Richard Harris. I think now is time for a beverage.